Okay. Well, I, I, it's always nice to be invited to talk about your own thoughts, you know, so I, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I thought the, maybe the best intro would be, how did I get to where I am? Um, because uh, the notion of system is not native really either to Thomism or to standard Whiteheadianism. And I'm kind of a, a blend of Thomism and Whiteheadianism. Uh, neo Whiteheadian or neo thomistic well, not neo thomistic because that's, that's the Carl Rahner, uh, Bernard Lonergan school, but certainly neo Whiteheadian. Uh, the Whiteheadians uh, initially were just delighted to have a Catholic join them because they're mostly liberal Protestants. And, uh, <laughs> And then they said, oh, he isn't, he isn't quite one of us after all. <laughs> but to finally get to the point, why did I latch on to the notion of system? Well, because I was convinced that the, the dialogue between religion and science, while it was polite, wasn't going anywhere. And uh, it, there was exchanges like two ships in the night, kind of saluting one another as they went in opposite directions. And I said, well, what did, what did Thomas do in the 13th century? He took the best philosophical mind and the best scientific mind of the day, Aristotle, and converted it into a form of Christian revelation. It has its downside, its limitations, but it's still, it, it was a powerful rational tool for explaining the faith. And at the right at the beginning of the Summa, Thomas says, I want to go, proceed initially on grounds of faith, improving the existence of God and things of that nature. So I said, what is, what is becoming, or what is the dominant uh, paradigm concept in contemporary science? Well, even that's a huge field. But I settled rather quickly on what I think are the key science, natural sciences today, the life sciences. That's where the excitement is. With, with the possible exception of the quantum people trying to figure things out, you know. But in some sense, that's passe. The life sciences are dealing with the notion of emergence. Life from non-life, matter from mind. Terence Deacon, who's out in California, uh, incomplete nature, how mind emerged from matter. He, he's more materialistic than I am, but. I, he uses the idea of the interplay of systems, converging systems that produce higher order systems. And eventually you get up to the very complex systems that account for consciousness and things like that. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the, it's still a, a, a hard one to put over on people, the notion of system, for a number of reasons. First of all, it seems to be people get scared that it's deterministic. Well, that's why I put in the subtitle, open-ended. Actually, the systems that are deterministic, the systems that are deterministic are usually thought up by human beings because they've got an end means uh, uh, mentality in mind. And so everything has, to, like Hegel with his phenomenology of mind or spirit, everything has to move from beginning to end in a very logical deterministic pattern. But the systems in nature are, tend to be open-ended. Otherwise, you, could, you couldn't have evolution. Evolution only takes place when the system itself is capable of being influenced by its environment and it can adapt to it. So that was the idea behind a systems approach uh, on a philosophical level. Um, but as I got into it, I realized that this is going to move me more away from Aquinas than I initially thought. Because in a system, the energy of the system, the activity of the system comes from the matter, the material components that together produce, by their interaction, produce something like a structure. And that becomes the system. <coughs> so new uh, s styles of existence emerge out of the interplay of material constituents within a, let's say, a combined field of activity between two previous systems. Um, what, what happens to form then? Form becomes passive. So it's the reverse of Aquinas, where Aquinas is, form is active, matter is passive. 
The form shapes the, the matter. No, the matter gives rise to the prevailing form. But the, the form is such that further activity among the constituents over time can make the form itself evolve. And that's where evolution comes in. Am I making sense to people? OK. Well, uh, that's, that's basically how it, it, it got started. Now, I'll just very quickly just point to language and culture. They're systems. But they're already given, aren't they? You, you grow up inside a, a language system and a cultural system. In your lifetime, you, you can see evolution in some measure of the way we use language, especially in English. We're so free in our adaptation of other languages for our own purposes. Uh, and you can also it, it see an evolution of culture, as we've seen in the 20th century here in the United States. Things are just different than they were right after the Second World War. Um, so um, I think we've got a couple more people coming in. So that's an example of what I mean about a system antedates you, shapes you, doesn't, doesn't determine you, but conditions you. And you, in turn, in conjunction with your contemporaries, have the power to slowly but surely alter the system. That idea was um, the, uh, I think it was Luckman, Thomas Luckman, the social construction of reality that came out in the 90s. That was way ahead of its time in, in that sense that it was seeing that people create systems, people can change systems. And there is, a, a, you know, there is a, an attitude in the United States today that we're all caught in this system that we can't get out of. No, yet. Well, yes, you can, but you can do it only if you get together with other people in a sufficiently unified way. Then you can, make the, you can change the system. That's the idea. Okay. Um, however, an open-ended system is based on kind of a, a metaphysics of becoming, not a metaphysics of being. There's nothing wrong with a metaphysics of being because there are things that are relatively straightforward and will always be pretty much the same. But by and large, if you believe in evolution, you have to say that there's an evolution of, an, at least in terms of understanding of things. And then eventually new structures come up, are brought together to uh, buttress the new understanding. Okay, uh, I'll make a brief mention also of Teilhard de Chardin and Whitehead since I have two Notable Tyardians here. Um, Tyard was on to the same thing. If you, I presume all of you have been somehow become acquainted with Tyard. The notion of even a grain of sand has an inside and an outside. That's very close to what Whitehead said. That the base, the the basic <coughs> units of realities of reality, physical reality are many organisms. It's not that they have um, consciousness, but they're responsive to their environment and they can act upon their environment. And that's what an organism does at even the most primitive levels. It's, it's, consciousness is a sophisticated form of responsiveness to your environment. So White isn't saying that, that you know, these atoms and molecules that make up this table are, um, uh, a, a, you know, alive to the point of being able to talk back to you and things of that nature. No, no. But the table, it, it, not the table itself, that's a thing, but its constituents do interact with one another, and over time, this table is going to deteriorate. Why? Because its constituents interact with one another in increasingly uh, defective ways, as opposed to the way they were designed to operate. And they fall apart. Or mountains, they're, they're never quite the same from one hundred years to another. They, they grow in size or depreciate in size. So what appears to be 
uh, absolutely unchanging things, there's subtle changes going on all the time. And of course, the obvious example is yourself. All the changes that have taken place in your, in your lifetime. <coughs> so in a certain sense, you're a different person than you were uh, 20 years earlier. You know? not, not so dramatically that you, know, you can't be held accountable for what you did then and, and so, so on and so forth. But still, um, well, we talk about conversion. What is conversion? An evolution in the way you behave. And so you have to have the ability to uh, respond to the challenge and uh, set, set, set something new going. Okay, um, another b advantage of the systems idea is that things basically by definition, an Aristotelian substance is an entity unto itself. It has its own accidental characteristics, but you can't merge substances. One has to become incorporated into the other. When, when I eat food or drink, they, 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 the food and the drink become part of me. They, they're, they're, they, they don't stay as like a, um, a turkey burger that I had earlier in the day. That, that turkey burger has become part of Joe Bracken. That's that, 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 it, it, well enough said. Uh, whereas systems interlock. And systems inside of systems is a perfectly agreeable idea. E actually, each of us is kind of a super system of subsystems. We've, we've got all kinds of systems of activity at work in the body. And they coordinate, they're interlayered with one another, and the mind does a, a measure of coordination uh, of that, but still the mind is affected as much by the body as the body is affected by the mind in this systems approach. Because where does the mind get its information? From the body. Where does the, where does the body get its information to keep moving one direction or another? From the mind. So it, the old idea of the, you're, you had the soul that, could, that in some sense can just depart from its body uh, it, is, well, it's scientifically very difficult to imagine. I've got a chapter on eternal life where I try to uh, it very tentatively offer one way of kind of having my cake and eat it too on that. that, that. <laughs> okay, um, so what I'm really urging then is panentheism. Not, not pantheism, but panentheism. Now, as one uh, deals Henry Gregerson said, everything depends upon what you mean by in. <laughs> and I'm saying it's system, lower level systems contributing to a higher level system, and the higher level system in turn giving directionality and order and purpose to the lower level system. And that, that will help me to explain the God-world relationship. We come forth from the divine life system using the same principle of creativity that empowers the three divine persons to relate to one another and become an organic corporate unity. Not, an, not the unity of an individual entity, but the unity of a corporate entity or a community. But it's an indissoluble community by definition rather than one that can break up and people go their own way. But out of that divine life system then, or the field of activity that it has, you have uh, the Big Bang and the creation building up as a uh, lower level system growing in order and complexity over the billions of years. But eventually it gets reincorporated back into the divine life system. Or it better, or we got no chance for eternal life. Life in this world is by definition, finite. You ain't going to survive. If you survive, you'll survive in independence on a higher power and incorporation into a higher type of life. That, that's heaven from a more academic point of view. Uh, so, we just take that for a moment? That oh, gonna... sure. I, I was running through the whole book, and maybe it's time. I just want to take a break here because so we've talked a little bit about panentheism. 
Now, if we take the approach that you're talking about, in other words, at this point, we're talking systems conceptually. In other words, these are the, uh, and if we can look at emergence as supervening systems. That's it. From, right. <coughs> so, so God then, in other words, if we talk about the Trinity as, as the um, highest system High, or the uh, governing system. Right. How then, in other words, how do we move from the notion that God is ontologically distinct yeah, from yeah. the created reality yeah. to this kind of governing system and what right. would be the relationship between the governing system of Trinity to the right. emergence of Trinity? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, okay. you know, <laughs> The, uh, the, higher, the higher order systems in nature emerge out of the interplay of the lower order systems. So if you follow the logic of that out, God would be the, the ultimate goal of the cosmic process. Finally, we would have God at the end of the cosmic process. So here's where you have to say, there, uh, and I think Trinity makes, makes more sense than the idea of one God here. You have to have a life system that is in integral to itself that does not need a subordinate system, a kind of a, a child, so to speak, of its own uh, upbringing and, and uh, origin. Now, a life system demands multiple con uh, constituents. And that's where Trinity makes a lot of sense Monotheism is difficult because, uh, <laughs> as one, one friend said to me, I, 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 maybe I should, well, I'm going to do it anyway. But, <laughs> but uh, he said, from a purely monotheistic uh, perspective, if you say that God is love, it's an act of masturbation. If, on the other hand, if you see it as a, as an interplay between three primordial loving persons, they can extend it. That, that lovingness, as parents do embracing children, to uh, offspring. And in a sense, the cosmic process is the offspring of the divine life, constituted by the three persons. And then the beauty of it, of it as I see, it allows for evolution because that that offspring, just like with a human fetus or a fertilized ovum, is very primitive, very limited, but it grows and grows. And like as Tayard says, it's complexity consciousness coming out. You know that the more complex, the more uh, of the uh, mental side, you might say, of the physical, basically physical being there is. But it's still out of freedom. In other words, is it, the act of creation out of freedom then? Oh, right, out of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Um, they they make the free choice to um, to equivalently create an image of themselves. And that's another idea. The image of God is not God as an individual entity, but God as a community. So they want they want a cosmic community that would correspond in a modest measure to their to the richness of their own divine communitarian life. And that's why we have the 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 interesting phenomenon of at the, at the Big Bang there was a tremendous explosion and then a contraction. If it, if it was just if it was just an explosion it would be over, it'd be like a, a you know Fourth of July uh, skyrocket, boom. If it, if it overly contracted, it go back to simply its source. But there was an expansion, contraction principle at work from the very beginning in creation. Yes? Um, regarding the Trinity as a system, it's also infinite, correct? Yes. So is there a problem with an infinite system or with finite systems that's a, another very good question. I, I, I would argue that the divine life is richer because of the presence of, and reality of creation. So in a certain sense, it's, it's not the original divine life system, but an enriched divine life system through the co-participation of a, a created world.
So there, there is no real uh, barrier. No. It's not like no. You're right. And here's, here's, here's the thing that has always attracted me about this. You can let science do its thing because it's working in the lower order. Theology is bringing in the upper order, the higher order. Science, there's a lot of questions science does not, is not able to answer. Value, purpose, all those things. You have to call on the on the humanities, particularly philosophy and theology, to, to settle the ethical or the value questions. So there should be that working collaboration. Uh, there's a wonderful little book out just published by Alistair McGrath, who is the man in charge of the um, Ian, what is it, Ian? Uh, in, in Oxford. Ian Ramsey Institute. Uh, um, uh, now I'm blanking on his name, but in any case, he's got a new book called Enriching Our Vision of Reality. And, and he was a practicing scientist before he got interested in the theological implications of his science and got himself a PhD in theology. Um, it'll come to me in a minute what his name is. Alistair McGrath. Yeah, you said that. Too. Yes, yes. That's um, I, I marvel at it. I, I think it's a perfect book for adult discussion groups and parishes and so on. It's written so simply and anecdotally because he's going back to experiences with others as a scientist and experiences with others as a theologian. And what is it called again? You got the name. Enriching our vision of reality, which is exactly what I had in mind by the notion of the super system, if you will. Mm. But then what gives rise to the super system? In other words, the ancients had a notion of how the Trinity, uh, in other words, that the Father as the, the font, you know, the source, uh, the Son as the subject. So what, what then constitutes the super system, even as we know that it's Trinity? Well, the, the, um, the, the super system, in a sense, is the word incarnate. And if the word is incarnate, that affects the Father and the Spirit equally, equally as much. In other words, the old idea is, you know, does, does God suffer? Well, Jesus in his humanity, which is part of his divinity, suffered. And if he shares everything with the Father and the Spirit, they too suffer in some sense. And they got a lot to suffer about, considering the way this world is going. You know, they they had something much better in mind, but it didn't work out. And that's because they work more off of a, in in line with inner subjectivity, a principle of persuasion rather than coercion. You can get things done through coercion, but only short term because people rebel. Persuasion, you get inside them, and then they are agreeing with you and something long-term can come about. Yes, sir. So kind of going off of you know, what Dr. Dahlia has been asking, um, do you see the Trinity as necessarily an open system, or is it like there's a possibility of it being closed, right? So this is the yeah, I would, I, 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 if I were a Thomist, I would say it's closed. Right. Because eternal and unchanging are characteristics drawn from Aristotle's unmoved mover that Aquinas attributed to God. I think it was a huge mistake, but uh, <laughs> it, it, understandable, very, yeah. quite understandable uh, in view of his times. And he had trouble enough convincing his contemporaries to even think about Aristotle, you know. And, but that, uh, anyway, um, now, now I've lost track of what I started to say. It's an open, I, I think God too evolves. I think the reason why they created was they wanted to evolve. And what does that mean exactly? What, what does that mean in saying that God evolves? Well, basically, if it's a life system, if it isn't growing, it's dying. So in a certain sense, every life system has to evolve in order to um, uh, 
the energy needed to sustain itself comes from interaction with other systems or other individuals. And if, if there's increasing lack of interaction, you're dying. And maybe that's overly simple. Yeah, because I think there's two ways to look at it. I mean, you can say, I mean, if you were to hold, say, a traditional view of God vis-a-vis -vis evolution, you can say things change over and again, in other words, God as sort of the, the backup, the absolute, immutable, unchangeable one as the ground of everything that's changed. Well, right. What I should say is this. Uh, there are, uh, here I, you could go to an Aristotelian thing. There are accidental changes and there are substantial changes. We're never going to see a substantial change in the, in the relations of the divine persons to one another. That's fixed. But on the other hand, what can come out of it can be added to and in some measure withdrawn from, depending upon the interaction. Yes? How do those terms, and pardon my voice, um, still make sense in the process of <clears throat> system situation? Actually, the substance, when substance itself is really almost epiphenomenal to process. Well, it, it, substance is a no-no in process thought. That's why they use the term society for the, the series of actual entities creates kind of a, a form that's common to them all and gives them some sort of ontological identity. Now, here's where Whitehead is wishy-washy, and I, I picked that up maybe as a former Thomas, that he really didn't settle on what a society, he has something in his book, The Adventures of Ideas, where he says, you know, a society has an essential characteristic and has, can have uh, accidental characteristics as well. In that sense, it's somewhat like a, an Aristotelian substance. End of statement. He never carries it forward because I think he was scared that if he got too far into substance language, he'd be back into the older system that he felt obliged to critique. But, it, but it's a flaw. And I've, I've worked very hard at uh, con convincing my fellow Whiteheadians that it, it, uh, he has a, this statement, the final real things of which the world is made up are moments of experience. And that fits beautifully with a atomistic approach to reality. And I say, no, no. The final real things that exist are actual entities and societies. Because without societies, actual entities just come and go. They only have meaning and value if they have contributed to something that lasts, that's bigger than themselves. It, it, see, Whitehead was still very much a natural scientist with the analytical tradition the whole is made up of the sum of the parts. And I'm, I'm into the synthetic tradition. The parts contribute to the whole, but the whole is more than the sum of the parts. It's something other as well as more than the sum of the parts. And it seems to me that <clears throat> there was a feedback loop of reflexivity in the way you're looking at it, that the whole can also inform the parts. Exactly. Well, actually, that's in Hegel. Hegel's idea is right there in the preface to the phenomenology of mind that a part means to be part of a whole. So it contributes to something bigger than itself. And that's why he needed the whole span of history to give himself the full notion of uh, uh, absolute spirit. But go ahead. Right, it, you, exactly right. That's, that's been a standard critique of Hegel that ultimately, <laughs> in fact, he even talked about the slaughter bench of history. You know, that, that things contribute, well, we know, good or bad, they contribute to the rise, to the full self-manifestation of absolute spirit. So in that open trinity sense where that's not the case. Where that's not the case. Right, right. God, God's self is changing. It, it, not, it, essentially, no, but in terms of what 
uh, it can be creatively added, yes. We make a difference to God. I've had, that, I've had undergrads say, do you really think, I mean, give, there are billions of people in this world, do you think God really has anything, any care for me? I say, uh, he better. <laughs> He's responsible, ultimately. <laughs> and, and that's a, you know, a, pass, a quick pass off, but, um, but still, the, where I would differ from Whitehead and many Whiteheadians is, uh, see, the, the way in which God influences creation from Whitehead is that God gets in there when this actual entity is constituting itself. You see, everything creates itself for Whitehead, but there can be influences from the past of his own historical history or from God in, in terms of what he calls the divine initial aim. And that's so that God is, is offering you alternatives, and one of them is clearly what God would prefer for you. And on a feeling level, God is urging you that. It's like grace, very close to the Christian notion of grace actual grace uh, but on the other hand I think I think God has bigger fish to fry than that take care of zillions of actual entities coming into existence giving each I think what God does is sets up that structure that they can find God's intention they can they can feel God's feeling for the structures that God wants and then they incorporate that structure into their own self-constitution Well, the, it is intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity. Yeah, it's just intersubjectivity within the Trinity is carried over into intersubjectivity uh, of God with the world of creation. If it's, if it's understood as a world of microorganisms mm -hmm. endowed with some measure of subjectivity. So, so God can affect the world, in other words, by these kinds of yeah. words, and the world can affect God. Yes, so it does. In, in that sense, Positing a type of univocal type of being, a type of system where, in other words, there is no uh, distinct ontological difference in the order of being, um, insofar as God and world then are mutually interacting then in a type of right. But but it, you can also see some forms of systems interaction are are reciprocal in the strictest sense. Mm -hmm. They're both about of the same quality of, uh, uh, you know, organization and so on. And then there's the, the subtle, the subtle uh, influence of the higher order system on the lower order system. Again, the mind-body relationship. The mind cannot absolutely dictate to the body what it's going to do. Just try it, you know. You, you stay up all night for an, an exam and you're just pooped. You, 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 you're wasting your time taking an exam. Your mind won't work because it didn't get enough sleep. On the other hand, the mind, what's the, what's, what value is the mind if you're not being fed information upon which to reflect and make decisions? So in a certain sense, the mind gives directionality as God gives directionality to the cosmic process. But it is a kind of a trial and error thing. And that fits in beautifully with the problem of evil. Is God responsible for all the bad things that have happened? No way. Because the primary causality is the causality of the creature, not the causality of God. God is coming in there as a kind of a, a, a secondary cause in the sense of contributing to something that, where the decision is made by an entity other than God. See, for Thomism, God is the primary causality, and, and the creature turns out to be the instrument of divine providence. And then you have the dicey question of how free are we if we're all following a divine plan that's been there from all eternity. Turn it around and say the creature is the primary cause of its either goodness or badness, and... Um, and God is more or less the one, uh, the way I've explained it to undergrads is uh, 
God keeps going from plan A to plan B to plan C. So just taking into account the things that have happened and saying, in view of the divine, the infinity of divine possibilities, saying, well, that didn't really work, but here's another thing. You can make, you can make lemon out of a lemon, uh, lemonade out of a lemon after all if you go this route. And that's the way it tends to work. There's, nothing, there's very little in life that is totally bad or totally good. It's always a blend, depending upon which is more predominant. That's one of the questions I've, I've had reading all this stuff, and I addressed this to you last week. So you said divine life is richer because of participation with the created world. Yes. So the risk, there's a risk associated with creation um, for God. Yes, But it my question is then, like, are we being aspirational about it? Like, we say, oh, so then the more love there is in the world, God becomes more loving. But there's also a lot of hatred. So is there yeah. a risk that God becomes less... I mean, what, like, how real is the risk here? Yeah, I, well, it's, it's not a risk to the integrity of the divine life, that you'd have to say. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, the richness of the divine life could be quite seriously affected by what goes on. On the other hand, see, we, we look at something that just went wrong and say, oh, I can't believe this happened. God did know what, what, what could very well have happened and has already thought up plan B to start taking care of it. Yeah. Just on the tail of that, you know, how free is the creation then? I mean, could God have kicked this off in a sense and said, well, this could go really badly? You know? Well, basically, uh, again, you have the, the responsiveness of, a let's say, an atom or a molecule, which is just very close to pure mechanism, you know. And then you have the responsiveness of a, of a human being which, who is capable of what we call mortal sin. But, uh, and that mortal sin probably affect, does affect God nearly so much as it affects your relations with other creatures. But somehow, there's a beautiful, the last chapter of Process and Reality is poetic. Because Whitehead equivalently says God saves everything that can be saved and makes use of what in the world would otherwise be considered wreckage. That's beautiful. But I think it exactly corresponds to how God has worked through the centuries. So it, it, creation has been a trial and error thing right from the start. Does that mean then that, that the world might, you know, there might be a, a nuclear blast that could, um, you know, create a, a nuclear winter and we'd all die. Maybe the cockroaches would survive, but we'd be gone. Yeah. But somehow, God will find something coming out of that, perhaps by the way of moral heroism, people helping other people. Like, you know, Hurricane Harvey brought out a lot of good in a lot of people that they normally didn't realize they had. Is he what? God's self co-constituted by creation. Co-conscious. Constituted. Oh, no. Like not, not essentially. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, uh, he, here you can go back to what is valid in, in, in Aristotelian Thomism. There are things that are essential versus things that are accidental. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, the, the essence itself, through the accidents, will evolve in some measure also, but it still will lose its own... It'll never lose its own essential self-identity. <clears throat> yes? Um, in your book, you say that um, with the creation, the Trinity, the triune God, decided to incorporate creation into itself. I mean, yeah, that's right. So, um, but I guess you're also saying that um, while creation then becomes part of God, Well, put it this way. I, it, it, what, what I appeal to in one chapter, the best example of what I'm driving at is what we call the incarnation. One person, two natures. 
and if you're, if you're using this systems approach, somehow the divinity is tested by the limits of the humanity of Jesus. And the humanity of Jesus is tested by the, by the uh, shall we say, the ideals, the goals of the divinity. So in that sense, Jesus got tired. God doesn't get tired. But he was a divine person, so he got tired because he had a bona fide human nature. It, it wasn't just an add-on. It became part of him, his divine personality. So that's uh, kind of a metaphor for what happens at the macro level, I guess you could say. Yeah. Actually, again, here's a, this again is a thing that I've, I've raised this issue and other people have pulled back from it, but I still think it's worth thinking about. The incarnation began with the act of creation. It, it hit its high point in Jesus. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> okay. And so as a result, there was no dramatic intervention of God into human history to create this special person that would change the world around. No, no. It's part of an overall cosmic incarnational process. And we're nowhere near the end of it, presumably. Can I add this too? It, I, um, something you said earlier. Uh, how do you see that evolution, you know, the end point, where we're going? Yeah. It, um, it, yeah, well, a standard white heading would say that the cosmic process never ends. Because without the process, God has no reason to exist. And I say, too bad, folks. That's why you should have gone, started out with the Trinity rather than a monotheistic God. But on the other hand, Whitehead was a philosopher. He didn't want to get involved in theological doctrines. And like Aristotle, he thought, well, the world is there, and there's, we really have trouble thinking of a moment before the world was there. So let's just presume it was eternal. And therefore, it had an eternal partner in a creative God. But um, now, that was half the question, but I've forgotten yeah. the other half. So, you know, I guess I think of Teilhard, you know, saying uh, that we become more and more conscious and we become, you know. We enter the superconscious. Yeah, there's something yeah. about being more spiritual or something like that. Now, what happens? I mean, what happens in the end? Do we well, become God? Well, is there an end? Yeah, I don't well know. put it this way. There's, there's an end to our universe. There might be others. There might have been one before it. There might be another after it. Whitehead talked about epochs, not about beginning and end. Uh, and for that matter, there could be several going on at the same time. But let's prescind from all those questions. Uh, but the big thing is, uh, and I pointed this out in an article for the, the English Spirituality <coughs> Journal, The Way. The body of Christ is not the person of Jesus. The body of Christ is the mystical body. And that's the way they originally understood it. Only after they got into the Eucharistic disputes about whether Jesus is really there or not did the notion the body of Christ get fixated principally on Jesus. No, the body of Christ is a cosmic community which will live within the, cons the Trinitarian community and be the corporate image of God, which, which is in a, gives us a chance for immortality and God a sense of um, a, a fullness. Yes? Um, could you elaborate more on your statement that incarnation began with creation? Yeah. Well, again, the idea is uh, it, it goes back to a kind of a, a philosophical principle for me. Subjectivity demands expression in objectivity. Now, if you have three intersubjective uh, uh, persons, intersubjective related persons within the Trinity, their primary manifestation, corporate manifestation, is to be this corporate thing, a community. But there's no reason why they can't broaden that community. Uh, again, out of love, not out of necessity. They don't have to have 
a creation. Uh, and so, um, in that sense, um, it's, it's an enrichment of the divine life, but not a constitutive of the divine life. On the other hand, it's not bad to be an enrichment of God if that means that you're going to survive beyond your physical death. In fact, Ephesians and Colossians, you know, in those opening chapters, that's what they're talking about. That all things in Christ. I was wondering too, in terms of, of the dimension of matter, what would you think of that with incarnation versus Christ in, in terms of enfleshment matter? Right. Uh, that the um, um, the enlivening that matter if you compare matter and spirit are inseparable, but that the the um, the Trinity is enlivening. Well, they're first of all creating the equivalent of a material thing in their own community simply as a corporate entitative reality. And so it's, they're not just three subjects, but they're three subjects who are together one entitative reality. That's, where we, that's the justification for God is one, that there is an entitative reality there which is unified. So instead of unity being... Um, homogeneously organized is heterogeneously organized. It, it's composed of multiple interacting parts rather than simply itself. Uh, Thomas, for example, in the Summa says, God is simple. That's because he had God as a, it, parts would have meant defect in God. No, it's, it's an enrichment of God if, if, if they're properly understood, but again, Thomas was dealing with the philosophy of his day. So I, I don't know if I answered your question or not. I'm just wondering what do we mean when we say incarnation? Is we're not talking uh, is only about the particularity of, of Jesus and, and the, the two natures. If you could elaborate some more on that, you know, if we're talking about incarnation um, from the beginning. Well, in some sense, God has been incorporating into God's self the reality of a created world. And it hit a high point in Jesus. Because the reality of God and the reality of creation merged in one person. Because we do say it's, it's in Chalcedon that you don't have a division between the two. They flow into one another. And I said, well, the best way to explain that is through systems, not through natures understood as different things. On the tail of that, if I can, because um, I've been thinking about the status of matter in this, in this system. So there's a sense that you talk about where there's not a duality, these are interlocking systems. Right. Well, again, Whitehead would say uh, that everything that can be saved will be saved. Will all of material creation be incorporated into God? Will, uh, you know, mosquitoes be incorporated into God? I, 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 <laughs> there, there may be things that just drop out because they're no longer of utility to the broader corporate reality. Well, this, this pain and suffering, so sorry about that, guys. I'm over here to build my bridge now. You know? Well, basically, <laughs> married couples, in a certain <laughs> sense, use one another. But, but over time, they realize that that's not, that's not the real game in town. That, that, ironically, to give to the other is more important than what you get from the other. And then I think you've got this idea of Bodified inner subjectivity. That uh, the um, who was it that? Well, I think it was Nancy Murphy and George Ellis in their book on the moral nature of the universe. They have some midway through that book, they say the principle of evolution is self renunciation. And when I've taught that in class. Any number of kids. Well, actually, they broke into two groups. 
the kids who had had what, what we call that experience of you know, going to a poor country and living there for a semester or a year, they said, right on. That's exactly how people in those countries live. They care for one another. They'll share things that they, that they themselves only have a very modest amount of. It's the rich countries where you can't, that doesn't fly. And, and, and it was exemplified in so many of the, of the undergrads that said, what the hell, I'm not paying this kind of tuition to go to Xavier to self-renounce myself. I want, you know, wife or husband, two-car garage, house in the suburbs. Pardon? Right. right. And so it's not really significant to me that, you know, how many of my cells fall off the internet or whatever. So it's, uh, you know, it, but there is something about the, the system of who I am, right, that well, is important. Yeah. And the mosquito, too. I mean, I'm thinking the same way. The, I don't yeah. know. There's, you know, it's not of the same. I mean, there's something more to me than right. Than yeah, right. You're getting at the idea of the, of the resurrection of the body. Yeah. Right. And, and basically, it, 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 at least within my own thinking, and for whatever you want to call it, the, the physical body falls apart. But the pattern of your life has been incorporated first it, both into your mind, your psyche, because you, you carry the whole pattern of your past life's decisions unconsciously with you from moment to moment. And more importantly, it's incorporated into the divine pattern of life. See, that's what Whitehead meant by the consequent nature of God. That everything that it happens gets incorporated into God's life. Now, he settled for objective immortality in God. That's not enough for me. But if you, if you have a way of preserving the final set of actual occasions proper to the mind of, of a human being, they could wake up in eternity and see the pattern of their life reflected in, in their vision of God. And then judgment comes in, will I accept it or will I reject it? And that's where heaven and hell come in. So I, I do believe in at least the possibility of hell. But in other words, God doesn't judge you. God says, look at your life. Do you accept the flawed life that it was? If so, I will forgive you and all the, all the folks in heaven will forgive you. But you're going to come in here as a forgiven sinner, not as a saint. And even the saints, <laughs> saints would say, would say, well, actually, I'm a forgiven sinner too. And some of them were pretty darn idiosyncratic, but that's another story. The, uh, the, but the, the big thing is, we will see ourselves in God, in that consequent nature of God, which is the pattern of the whole. We'll pick out our own pattern, and see how it affected other people's life patterns. Now, for some people, that's going to be a great moment of happiness and consolation. They were worth far more to other people than they ever realized. But for some other people who are pretty egotistical, it's going to be a big downer because they'll realize that they messed up a lot of people's lives. Thinking they were doing good in their own way, more for themselves than anybody else. So there will be kind of a purgatory to come around to saying, yet. Yeah, this is my life. I accept it as a forgiven sinner, forgiven by God and the, and the heavenly host. If I can't bring myself to do that, God's going to say, you're in eternal life, but we're going to leave you alone for a while. And that's Sartre's thing, you know. The people in hell are basically alone. They have no companionship. And that, that, that kills you far more than, you know, the fires of hell. At least I, in my judgment. You don't need fire to feel miserable. <laughs> yes? So you, you just mentioned uh, the consequent nature of God. And so I'm a fan of Whitehead most of the time. 
They're really good. But the thing, but the thing that I always struggled with was his conception of God in process of reality. I think, like you said, he had some really beautiful things to say about God, especially in the last chapter. Um, I guess this is more of a question about Whitehead. Just mm -hmm. uh, why do you think he thought those things about God? It seems to me my hypothesis was basically that Whitehead was just kind of a common sense theist, and so when he went to do this philosophical project, he was just like, oh yeah, God is like the big guy in the universe. With well, us. actually, he was the son of a, a, a British um, uh, pastor or oh. minister. Of what, I forget whether pastor or not. Originally, he was a theist. He became an atheist and then returned to being a theist. And the reason for his returning to being a theist is he says uh, creation as an ongoing process needs a principle of order and a principle of novelty. And it can't draw it out of itself. Or at least it won't be creative enough if it's in one way or another just repeating the past. So that was his argument that he had to have a, a divine principle, but he made it coordinate with the world because he didn't need anything more <coughs> than a God in constant engagement with the world. He didn't want to get into strictly theological things like the Trinity transcendence of God because then he wouldn't know how to get God and the world back together again, you know, in that sense. So he was just positing just <coughs> enough of God to make the system work without... Exactly. Yeah, he was basically a cosmologist, not a theologian. Okay. And so then my follow-up question would be, um, in what sense for you is the sort of dynamic between the primordial and consequent nature of God in history and time still operative in your uh, Trinitarian thought? And right. And in what sense is it, and, what, and how is that sort of um, different from white head? Well, basically, what, I love the idea of the primordial nature of God as this vision of endless possibility. But that could be shared by three divine persons. They have, in a sense, a common mind and a common will. And, and then if they incorporate into their, what we call in scripture, the kingdom of God, everything that happens, the extension of their own life, the, the kingdom of God, then it's recorded there. And it gives them the opportunity to keep helping the creatures to somehow turn a, a lemon into lemonade when things go bad. There's always something good that come out of anything, even the worst evil, ha can be productive of good. The, the Holocaust is a perfect example. It, it, it awakened Christians to the fact that they're anti-Semites. <laughs> That's what it really, that, that, hit, that hit the Western world like a cannonball when they, they smoked what the Nazis were doing to those poor Jewish people.
No, that, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, novelty, uh, uh, the, the problem with an eternal, unchanging God is where's the novelty going to arise, even for God? Uh, but it, it, the, the whole idea of life as an adventure is something that uh, maybe God shares in the adventure of creation. Because things happened that was what were possibilities for God had become actualities. And they've been incorporated somehow into the divine life. So maybe put it this way. The incarnation was, has always been a possibility for the Trinity, or the incarnation of Jesus. But only once did it become actual. But when it did happen, it had a dramatic effect. That passage from potentiality to actuality, uh, you, you, if, you, if you're a materialist, it happened by chance, coincidence of external forces. But if you're somebody like Whitehead, thinking in terms of many organisms, no. A decision was made, a risk was taken, a decision was made, and novelty came into the world. So then would you agree with Jungle that God's being isn't becoming? Is, it is, an, again, not essential becoming, but in, yes, it is becoming. And that's the nature of God, is yeah. becoming. Yeah, right. Words, Creativity is a principle of becoming, and. I'm saying that it's the, it's the nature of God. You, you mentioned um, the kingdom of God uh, earlier. I think, and I think you were saying that it, it meant God incorporating all of creation, creation into God's self. Yeah. Oh, or sure, is that a sure. Truly supernatural. No, no, no. It, it, creation is being incorporated into God progressively. As we speak. Yeah. And so, is the kingdom being, therefore, progressively um, extended to, into creation as well as we speak? Is that what you're saying? Say that again. Is, 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 the, is the kingdom becoming right now? Yeah. Yeah. Here in this classroom. Yes, yes. Okay. I was wondering. Right. <laughs> and and if, in my vision, God hasn't already settled upon how it's going to end. That it, it's, if, if you're really going to allow for creativity in creation, you have to give the creature a measure of spontaneity or freedom. So it, and, and, and that I think God can pretty well figure out in advance, given all these possibilities of which God is aware, this is how it's in all likelihood going to end. But no absolute certitude so it actually happens. Is there directionality? Oh, of course. That's, that's what uh, uh, Whitehead meant by the initial aim. The gentle persuasion, as opposed to saying, do this or you'll pay for it. Yes. Um, Sister Ilya asked if so God's being is um, becoming, and you said what's well, not essential becoming. So I guess I'm not understanding the difference. What would it be to say God's essential being is becoming versus? Because uh, it sounds like you're saying He can be God can become only within certain parameters. But how do we arrive at those parameters? Well, if if you again, there there are people that were very much close to Whitehead in one sense that they were process oriented, but they really thought that creation was producing the reality of God. And uh, Whitehead was shrewd enough to say, no, no. They're the co-eternal principles, but different from one another. And I would say more than co-eternal principles, primordial source that becomes a co-eternal principle with created world in producing something called the kingdom of God. So we, we really are created co-creators. Philip Hefner's idea years ago is, is on. You can quibble about it from a scientific perspective, but it's a brilliant insight that, that we are in this world to help God create the best possible world.
incarnation, right? So, yeah. in other words, even this Trinitarian reality uh, really is in, it really incarnation is the. Well, it, its own incarnation was to simply create this corporate reality of themselves. But again, love tends, that's Bonaventurian, love overflows. Why stop with this internal life of ours? Why not spread the goodness around? But then the risk involved is, if you give the creatures genuine, spontaneous ability to say no, you're, you're heading into a can of worms, which is the way things have actually turned out. <laughs> yes, sir. There's, there is both immutability and an immutability. R right, immutable, Im essentially immutable okay. in terms of the relations of the three persons. Right. But if you're gonna have a real bona fide creation with a measure of spontaneity, re reciprocity, then there is uh, right. accidental mutability. So it sounds like, as I continue to work that out in terms of the idea of the Trinity as a superstructure and the way that structures align seems like then God's essence is the governing principle of the superstructure. Yes, but God is also a reality unto God's self, but has chosen to be the governing principle, governing principle in the sense, the directional principle, the inspirational principle. The governing principle means things are gonna go our way or, or the highway, you know? My way or the highway. No, God works through persuasion, not through. So relationality is, is fundamental. Here. That's it, exactly. Yeah. Relationality yeah. demands a, a reciprocity, or it doesn't. There really is no relationality, it's, except one of subordination. Mm -hmm. so any difference? But mutuality depends upon both sides saying yes. Is there any difference in saying that God is creating, um, God is inspirational, the spirit of God is hovering. Exactly, that's it. And that, that in, in some sense, from the very beginning of the book of Genesis. Yes, exactly. Where is the word that is creator, and the word is incarnate, and we know the language you're using is, could, could just as easily be used in terms of those relatively, um, those, those apparently traditional yeah, right. You can. You, I, I really think you can take all the traditional scriptural language and find an appropriate place to put them. And just bear in mind that what one does, all three do. It's kind of a, that's more division in our minds of who's doing what. All three create, all three redeem, all three sanctify, but in coordinated ways that are different from one to another. And, and back to Kathleen's comment about the body, isn't that, I mean, this is what you're saying, just another way of being, um, of talking about a spiritual body, First Corinthians? Yeah, right. The physical body, uh, in that sense, it, insofar as its energy, it's, some of that energy w will not be needed in the next life because you'll be living off the divine energy. So you can let the, the, the physical body deteriorate, provided that the pattern of the, all the patterns of the physical body from your moment of conception onwards stay with you and stay in this uh, pattern of life. It, it, it looks completely absurd to talk about a spiritual body. Well, it does. But is, is that not exactly what you've been talking about? Yes, yes. In the effort recognize that there is a question of matter. Right. But matter is part of something it, it's been it's been divinized. Beyond itself. It's been transformed. Resurrected. Resurrected. Yeah. Language again. Right. No, that that's Paul, the spiritual body. But it, it isn't like you, you could survive in heaven until the last judgment and then then get your body back. No, no, no. It, 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 there ain't enough matter to go around. <laughs> 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 it, 
it, I mean, after all, if, if you believe in the principle of the conservation of energy, which is a good scientific principle, I, I'm, I'm absorbing uh, ed, material reality from somebody before me, and I'm going to hand it off to somebody else or some, something else, you know. But that pool of energy, which is creation, it never really loses energy. It just changes from one form to another. Pardon? Yeah, I've read Augustine. Ratio, is, causales, you know, the, the causal reasons at the beginning. Oh, the, yeah, the ratio and seminales. Or causales. Or causales? Yeah. Okay, well, I, I learned it as seminales, but that's well, no, okay. It's both, but it's mostly causales. I see. Well, again, uh, as long as, uh, again, is that a form of the older formal causality where it's kind of directing things, it's or is it? Okay, all right, well then if it's energizing the material constituents, <clears throat> I'm with you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I, I really think we've, we've created problems for ourselves in classical th theology in terms of human freedom, uh, you know, who is responsible for evil and so on and so forth by that uh, kind of deterministic understanding of the primary causality of God where everything's part of a divine plan. You're walking through a script, you just don't know it. I'm, I'm very biased on all that because I'm an Augustinian. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. And, and I, don't, I don't think Thomas or the scholastics did a great job with understanding uh, well, Augustine. Well, that's probably true. I mean, again, I say that as an amateur, but see, he was creative in a way that Thomas was not. I mean, Thomas was creative in his own way in taking over the Aristotelian corpus. But Augustine was, in principle, a more open-minded sort of, kind of finding new things to think about and, and give praise to God about all the time. Again, Thomas wrote some very beautiful Eucharistic hymns. So let's not knock the to Aquinas very hard. But he wasn't uh, organized almost to a fault. And, and well, that's not my problem. <laughs> I have to say, I'm in highly intuitive, as you, as you have come to realize. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm thinking um, in light of several comments, but even going all the way back to your, your really helpful intro to us about um, sort of why some people get very wary of systems thought about sort of this sort of jumping to the assumption that it could be too overly deterministic. Yeah, right? yeah. And so, in light of several things that have been said here, I'm asking this, uh, this question of myself uh, in terms of agency, which is a point that you bring up several times in the book. And you know, what does sort of this, this understanding of Trinity, therefore, as an open system, what does that do, sort of, and this is, this is me as the ethicist asking this question, what does that do for human agency, right? Is, is human agency a, is, is agency seen more in terms of the human person, or should we think agency more in sort of a collective notion of a system, right? A systemic mm -hmm. idea of agency, or is right. it a res reciprocity of both? Like, right. I'm wondering what, what if you can explicate a bit more about this notion of agency that you bring up. Well, well the standard systems people, like Laszlo and others, they say systems exercise agency, and I'd say, yes, but it's a collective agency. It, the real agency, the real energy, is down there in the constituents. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, you what you have is um, it, it kind of what um, you know the, that celebrated atheist. You have uh, what was it now? Contingency and, and determinism, or something. Uh, in, in any case, life is a balance of determinism and contingency. The determinism comes in the structure that you set at least for the moment and will guide the next set of uh, moments of experience until over time you begin to say this is not working well anymore. And then the agents, the constituents, change the structure. Exactly, exactly. Decision. That's so it. They're, they're reciprocally related. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a role for, for personal agency, right. but it's not autonomous agency. So the agent itself has an impact on, because it's relation, 
causality. So part of the dance relationality you're having is this different form of causality. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's, that's helpful even sort of taking that notion of a, sort of for the time being, right? <coughs> there is a particular, it, it really, uh, it's a recognition of finiteness and human limits, I guess, to, to mm -hmm. sort of put it in terms of more right. practical. Yeah, you, your body participates in every decision you make. It has to. Yeah. Where did it get its information? Did the mind get it? Where did it get? Uh, it, how did it survive without it, you know being literally fed by the body? On the other hand, the body desperately needs the mind to be to be as creative and uh, in, in, ingenious in adapting to new situations that, that we are. So I guess building on that mind body analogy. Again, coming back to the God world relationship, we did talk a lot about you know, the systems. And I'm still, I'm still like to see maybe um, you know, more about the work here at the Illumination on how these systems between Trinity and created reality are interacting. What is the uh, the nature of that, or how are they, in a sense, uh, in reciprocal uh, relationship? And what does that mean then? for the life of God in creation, and what does it mean for creation in the life of God? Uh, especially as open systems, since we're saying that the life of yeah. God, that God is, as a system, is an open system, which means any system that's open is always then open to uh, outside influences or other yeah, things. Yeah. And what that, so I would like to see maybe a clearer... Um, well, well, the example that I tend to use uh, is drawn from science, uh, but I think it's good science, as far as I know, that atoms retain their ontological identity even when they're components of molecules. On the other hand, the molecule uh, it does have a directionality. It, the, the activity of the atom now becomes limited when it becomes part of a very specific molecule. So there is a constraint. That's, what, that's Deacon's mm -hmm. sacred term. There's constraint on both sides. The higher order system can't do what it wants with the lower order system because it has its own integrity. Mm -hmm. right. And the lower order system, for the very same reason, cannot do what it wants if it's gonna remain part of the higher order system. And yet I think it's precisely because of the constraints that you have the openness to transcendence. Yeah, yeah that's right. Mm -hmm. it, that, that's a big thing with, um, with a deacon, and it hit me like a cannonball. He said, freedom is not the ability to go in and choose any breakfast cereal in Kroger's that you feel like at the moment. Freedom is accepting the constraints that your past life has put on you mm -hmm. and being responsible for what the future is going to be when you make this present decision. That's real freedom. And I thought, by damn, you're right. You may be a materialist, but you're right. I, I call him a materialist because he, he stays with the the classical idea of the inert nature of matter, uh, the tiniest bits of matter, atoms and molecules, and then all of a sudden, boom, put them together in a sufficient combination, a soup of some kind, you know, uh, polymeric soup, and life, come here, give me a break. <laughs> Why not have the, the start of life down there in the, in the very atom, atoms and subatomic particles somehow having some measure of spontaneity to get together and then keep building. Mm -hmm. And that's Tyardian, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yes? One of the things that came out, especially early on in your book, when you're talking about the constitution of actual entities, and yeah. locations, and kind of getting into the nitty gritty of, of the sort of lower level, uh, or, or fundamental level of, of the metaphysics that mm -hmm. you're dealing with, was like, sort of entertaining like what it could be like <laughs> or, you know, and, um, which raises issues, which raises sort of the interesting kind of or gestures toward the sort of panpsychist. Like, yeah, well, th th that's th that's a th yeah. that's the bugbear word for so many of people. I I don't want to be a panpsychist. Well, can you elaborate more on? Well, I would say reality is non-dual. It's neither matter nor spirit alone, but non-dual. See, we, again, I, uh, part of our Aristotelian heritage is the principle of non-contradiction. You can't have two contradictories in the same 
context. You have to choose one rather than the other. The Orientals for centuries with Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, non-duality is the name of the game. Everything is a both and. Nothing is ever captured in one dimension. It's, it has to be conjoined with at least one other dimension in order to become itself. See, that's the beauty of subsistent relations for Aquinas if he only had moved, you know, moved ahead, but it, it was too much, obviously, for a man of his age. But a subsistent relation means, basically, I become myself in becoming part of you. Your union differentiates, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, oh, oh, excuse me. No, okay. Well, it's just a very quick follow up. Can you, so, can you <coughs> elaborate real quick on your distinction between um, experience and consciousness, right? Consciousness right. Is consciousness is, is, a, is a, 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 this is pure Whiteheadianism right now, but I, I endorse <laughs> it. Uh, uh, um, Consciousness demands experience. Experience does not demand consciousness. In other words, consciousness is a higher order form of experience. It takes, a, it takes much more complex experience to produce consciousness. And Deacon would endorse that. Exactly, yeah. And that your mind affects your body, and your body affects your mind. Uh, I've heard not a whole lot, though, about your heart. And I don't mean pumping, you know, into your you know, life, into your body, but I'm talking about if you're, in, if you're an individual who believes in love, not that you're not speaking yeah. of love, it's been more systems, like, you know, whether it's a trinity, a god, whatever, you, it's to me the creative love. Yeah, exactly. And, and if you are a person who doesn't think really analytically, you know, I'm sure this book would be very difficult for me. But I believe, and I believe in God's abundant love, you know, creatively. And, and I said this to Sister Elliot. I heard one time, and I believe this, that we, and I believe I'm created by God, we are born divine, <coughs> right through our very DNA, and we spend the rest of our lives All right. It's the Alpha and the Omega. Yeah, all right. It's the beginning and the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about a purgatory anymore in my life. I went to first grade and I used to make room for the angel. You know, the guardian angel. I think it was ancient. But it's the. And it's everything in the universe. I mean, when I was driving here, it was dark out. The moon is as clear, the little crescent. The stars, and I believe that I don't come from dust. I don't want somebody to say, I'm too dusty, Tom. I'm from the stars. You know, and that's, that's just what I wanted to say. And, and, and uh, I feel it in the heart. And if someone says to me, well, you have that faith in the Trinity, that's a real mystery for me. Because in Scripture or in... Uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, the Spirit pops up everywhere. And I feel like when I go forth into the thing, into the reign of God, my spirit, MK, is going to be on this earth, dwelling within those who do my love. And as Jesus appeared, 
you know, to his disciples from what it says, they couldn't touch him from his skin. But yet he had a physical body. I don't know what it's like to die. I don't know what I'll look like or but I know I'll be in the glory of God and I won't be alone. So but could you just comment on the heart of it? Well the the heart <laughs> the heart is is affectivity. What I would call, in a technical language, it's affectivity, being affected by another and affecting another. And this is a totally relational approach to reality, which means that it's shot through with affectivity. It, it only works if you're willing to surrender in some measure to the other, even to be yourself. Okay, we're, we're on the same page without a doubt. Why don't you put it on me, and, and we'll just. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was. I thought we had finished. <laughs> okay. I, all right. Now let's see. There's there's been a lot of confusion. Uh, Catherine Lacuna, I think, took that much too literally. She was a dear friend, but she took that much too literally, and she really all but eliminated the imminent trinity, because it, uh, it became pure mystery to her. And I'm always suspicious of pure mystery. mystery. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, things can still be mysterious, but it, part of that is you don't, you don't know how to explain it. And that's why you're calling it a mystery. Uh, it, if, you, if you had the right conceptual tools, it wouldn't be quite so big a mystery anymore. But in any case, I think Rotter meant that there was a non-dual relationship there. Uh, and he didn't use that word, but that's really what he's trying to get at. She pulled back and focused on one of the, one of the partners to the non-duality and produced a monism of sorts. Because basically she has God um, uh, really, um, it's, it's the history of God as well as right. the history of the world. God in God's self is God in history and there's right. there's yeah, yeah. So there's one movement of God inward and outward. Mm hmm Right. I kind of like that idea. Pardon? I kind of like that idea. What, the Lacuna idea? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I'm, I'm also thinking that we, we come back, but uh, not, part of me says she's into uh, emanationism with a, a, more than a little bit of necessity tied to it, whereas for me it's, it's freedom. Freedom is, it's, we're, we're there, but we don't, we have a right to say no right up to the very end, you know, mm -hmm. in a way that I don't find it. it again, she, she was a dear friend. She got mad at me when I mentioned that I had misgivings in my review for theological studies. And more than a little frosty afterwards, but that's the way life goes. If you if if you use reviews just to compliment your friends, it's over. <laughs> yes. So I mean, going off this, so this is the thing that we've been kind of like 
circling the whole time. If the sort of uh, if if the life of creation is brought up into the divine life, but you still want to preserve an imminent Trinity. Yes. Like how how do you understand God being affected by it? like what part of God or how is God being affected by creation? I guess. Yeah, is that my question? question as well. Yeah. And I know there is this. Can I just extend that for you know? There's there is this traditional Aristotelian language of substance and accident. I'm wondering if we could almost sidestep it to talk about to what extent does God stay the same, and to what extent do you think that God does expand and change? Is it only something that is the appearance of change, or does God actually? Grow? No. I, here, here's how I would answer this. Basically, uh, creation was an, initially a possibility for God. It became an actuality, and it had to have an impact on God's own being. So the transition from potentiality, now see, in a strict Thomistic context, that can't happen because God is pure actuality. Ends I say. Yes, like that's right, yeah. But it would, it's, the big thing is, it, it, even for us, when a possibility becomes an actuality, it changes us. And to me, that would be the act of love, the act yeah. of eternal, in, in, right, in, in right, the divine right, love. Right, right, right. But we really, uh, I, I, I used to say, tell the, well, again, I think I already said that. Uh, uh, students say, do you think I make a difference to God? Well, of course. It's a love of relationship. Mm -hmm. How else could, could you not, now you say, well, I'm only one of 10, uh, seven or eight billion people, you know, and so on. Let, let God worry about that. that <laughs> that's, where, that's where the mystery comes yeah. in, that you have a. Yeah, that's right. With God. Yeah. Um, and and I, I hear what your concern is because that's our tendency is to think absorption. Yeah. That um, if, if creation is absorbed into God or blends into God, and then how does God affect it? Actually, God becomes really God. <laughs> that's the whole thing. And creation becomes really creation. And that really works then. Yeah, when, yeah. yes, that's uh, good. If we think in terms of systems, that God is, say, the overarching system or the infinite system within which the finite system is, you might say, in relationship, you know, so that this finite system is always in its integrity relationship precisely because it's in the infinite system of divine life, which is itself its own relation, you know, its own integrity as divine. Yeah, Does that's that it. That's Perfect. Perfect. Oh yeah, the, the, uh, the it was one. I forget what it was. Somebody did a video, uh, a podcast, as you say. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And it was it was kind of a question answer thing, with me on, on telephones, and he was he was taking it all down. Right. Yeah. Okay. So he actually like right out the the gate something about met methodology, and I don't remember exactly how he phrased it, but he said, you know, how how are you starting with these things? And you said you wanted to get behind the philosophy informing the theology in different like historical periods. So uh, you wanted to understand Aristotle. And you just said the prevailing way of understanding reality today is this, uh, this way that we're talking about open system. But then that even that's a contingent understanding of reality, right? Like sure. Open, because the open system is still evolving, so we could understand. So in the future, in 2,000 years, scientists and theologians could be looking at us the way we're looking at Aristotle. So then my question is, what is in, what is a norming norm within that the situation? The norming is norm. Still, is it still revelation? What, what would
with God be, because it's not like you're saying this is the reality of God. You're just saying this is a good way, probably the most to say than this one is, you know, this is a fitting way to talk about the Trinity. Yeah, th that seems a little bit demeaning, just a fitting way, as if, well, we'll, we'll, we'll but uh, to go back to your original point, and this, I, I have so much fun talking to my Whitehadian friends. They're, they're committed to process thought, but of course, Whitehead said the last word. Come on. <laughs> and and I, I always end up, these highly speculative articles and books by saying, this is a, a, a project, it, or it's a, it's a, it's a, a model, that, I, Ian Barber's model. And as a model, it has to be defective in some ways and really insightful in other ways. And sooner or later, people are going to deal with where it's defective and change it. So Bracken is not going to last forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure, on, on any level of, of, of thinking. Would scripture be a model? Yeah. yeah. So he's been saying so in 2,000 years and practice no more. You know, what will be the norm, so to speak, or what will, what's the continuation in the discontinuous theologies over the span of ages? All right. And I think one thing that we're saying is um, relationality and plurality, right? A system is a pluralistic um, collection of entities. So those two things are there. They're givens. They're, they're the basis for any discussion about God in the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, so relationality, uh, plurality, uh, emergence or transcendence. Like there's, yeah. crea there's creativity, there's creative components, and then out of that creative, there's a, a transcendent component. There's this, there's this um, component of novelty and transcendence. So in other words, those are the ingredients for whatever theology. I mean, we have to explain those are those are primal ingredients. Then you build the system, as we built the system on salvation, eschatology, and all those things. But what we're seeing here, fundamentally, even Thomas had ingredients of relationality and plurality right, right. and contingency and novelty. Well, he didn't have so much novelty there. Really. That was probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right. There are certain like there are certain fundamental ingredients. I think. Um, that constitute a God-world relationship, however we conceive God and that relationship to the world. You know, science changes. Say we become transhumanists, you know, techno-sapiens, techno-techno-sapiens in the year 2000, and we're now humanoid robots, you know, thinking about the God-world relationship. How will we think about this relationship? I think that's for sure. Or you just want Christology. Sorry, I was just saying, which is why Christology seems like it will always be. It will, because following Joe, that's what he's saying, this incarnation is the fundamental system, you might say, of a God-world relationship, as we understand God as pluralistic, communal, relational, Trinitarian, and that Trinitarian um, community of God incarnate you know, in uh, created reality. So that's the fundamental system. So incarnation is fundamental to whatever system you know, ensues in terms of how we understand about. Does that make, is that right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Actually, in, in, um, in, in many ways, the idea of unity as homogeneous was taken over from a secular source, uh, the, the, the mathematical point. You don't divide a point. Mm -hmm. A point is <laughs> indivisible by definition. Well, that got carried over into philosophy as a principle of philosophy. So the, what's really important about God is the unity in a homogeneous sense as an individual entity unto itself and so on and so on forth. Mm -hmm. the, the notion of plurality really only comes in with a metaphysics of becoming. The, 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 the classic definition of creativity in Whitehead is the many become one and are increased by one. So you, you have a constant moving from multiplicity into unity, and then that creates a new multiplicity that demands still further unification. Mm -hmm. There's your Norma Normans <laughs> uh, right yes, there.
may persist for another 2,000 years. But then you wonder whether God will reveal God's self again. If what? If God will reveal God's self in a scriptural way again, we don't know. Well, it's a question. Is revelation given entirely to yeah. us, and we're just discovering it all the time, yeah. uh, forever? Or is God always, you know, in the past? That's another, that's a, that's another the word is bigger than Jesus. Uh, and on the other hand, Jesus is the, in my judgment, is the fullest incarnation of the word, uh, at least in a person, that we we have yet to see. But could you admit that there might be other incarnations? Well, in some, there's I'm some. To well, the, the other world religions, the the founders yeah. of the other world religions, something's going on there that they, they have had enormous influence on millions of people. There's something by way of an incarnation that's not quite as full as, as in Jesus, but somehow the Spirit of God is at work in those other religions. I would say it's creativity. Uh, in, other, in other words, the three are one because they are, it's the, the many become one and are increased by one. There's a new a moment in the corporate life of God and, and corporate moments succeed one another. And, and so we see a pattern in the, in the <coughs> attitude of God, both, both to the persons of the Trinity and the, the world of creation. So is that to, I guess, another way to look at this would be so top down, but also in the sense of what you referred to with Whitehead in the kind of ambiguity that he talks about the, the, the well, really the essence of a society, what makes a society, right. the, what is the unchanging aspect of that society? Right. Um, does that then, is the same governing principle if it is created, creativity then apply to We'll say that again. Um, is the is there some sort of uh, parallel between the creativity of God and the essence of a society? Yes, it, 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 but again, creativity embraces both the plurality and the unity. That's it. So, so novelty and future are absolute in God, and 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 because they're absolute in God, they're sh they're shared in a finite way with creation. But creation is participating then in that in that ultimate absolute future of God. So you just said novelty and future are absolute in God. <laughs> God is God is love, right? God is created. God is love. So God is not a close, God is not like like a, a water fountain, you know, circling round and round and round. God is ever newness in love. In other words, the creativity that Joe's speaking about is 
God is designing me as a, a, a system of life, a system of love, a system of sharing, a system of relationality. And a system of divine shared relationality is ever renewing itself. It's always new and therefore always open and therefore always future oriented, always towards something, towards newness. And I do think that's that's the heart of crea creativity, creation itself. Yeah. So, the, so the, the fact that God is contingent is what makes him new. The fact that God is contingent? Yeah. No, not contingent. So God is absolute freedom in love, right? So there's no contingencies in God. That's what no. you're saying. That, so it's absolute creativity. Think of it Think of it this way. Think of unbounded love shared um, in the most absolute, intimate way. Um, and that love as without bounds, without, without contingencies, without necessities, and therefore a love that's always, um, you might say, seeking deeper union, um, and that union is always then on the uh, uh, open toward new, new life. And the, uh, just as a footnote to that, uh, maybe it's not a footnote, it might be an independent remark. My quarrel with the standard white Hadians is that your pure process you, the process has to result moment by moment in an entity. Mm -hmm. if, if, be, otherwise, you're into a, a Bergsonian universe where it, it's all flow, and it's only the mind that puts a stop to it. No, no. Whitehead was, was superior <coughs> to Bergson in that regard, mm -hmm. although he didn't emphasize it enough, and that's why he, un, he underplayed the role of the society as a structure that has relative permanence while these actual entities keep coming and going. As I, I think I've said this to you before, sometimes the language of structure and entity with regard to you know, uh, God can sometimes get in the way. Yep. You know, the language can uh, stifle us because it sounds impersonal, whereas you know, you know, God is deeply personal. Right. And so we're thinking of three persons in a very deeply personal way. That's what I was thinking about. Because there, there is this residue of, say, another Aristotle, for example, the unruly movement of Hinterdorf, this sort of distinct entity of, of being, and separate from trying to protect the, the transcendence, the godness of God. It's a very important line to collapse that. But in doing so, that language can often um, feel like it's if you're talking about things or an entity out there. You're talking about this radically relational. In some ways, you could see as more a kind of Hebraic covenantal. Yes, I think so. I mean, it moves through time, mm -hmm. and it is a relationship of love and it's open. And I think sometimes God, I think most people, I would say, think of like a God as an entity out there, a kind of super uh, person, you know, a hyper person mm -hmm. uh, who is somehow over and beyond or whatever. But what you're saying, too, is that God is love in a sense. And in some ways, then we can't say we know we know God is a mystery in that regard too. We can't define it all. We can say there is. We have these ideas of novelty, uh, boundless love, freedom, but we don't know. Exactly, well, because it's Are inexhaustible there? love. Right? right, divinity is inexhaustible. There, there's no finite mind that could ever grasp that infinite wellspring of, of and the fecundity of that love. You know, which makes thank God then the absolute future of all that is created out of love. You know, and that's what I think that I think that's why I like this notion of an open system, because I think an open system of persons in love or that deep relationality in love, which means that there's no, there's um, you know, with uh, in God there is no there is um, no evil. In God there is no space. In God there is no no doubt because everything then bears that uh, openness to life, to that fullness of love. And then thinking of that as a system, in other words, I like the idea of systems actually. That God system as a as a society, to use Joe's term, as you know, this co collective, you know, these persons in relationship deeply intertwined with one another. And then we're caught up, you might say, in that system as a finite system and independent system. So a person is a system. A, a classroom is a system. So we're systems within systems within systems, holes within holes within holes, so that every part <coughs> is a whole of the larger whole, you know, and the whole, the larger whole is in every part. So that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. to me. 
Yeah. <coughs> but I would just add to it that openness, you know, that openness of absolute love requires that openness of absolute love. And that's why I'm not going to say that 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 I'